so we come to our first Bible reading. Once, when they were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a slave girl who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and the rest of us, shouting, These men are servants of the Most High God, who are telling you the way to be saved. She kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so troubled that he turned round and said to the spirit, In the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When the owners of the slave girl realized that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. Upon receiving such orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open and everybody's chains came loose. The jailer woke up and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We are all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all the others in his house. At that hour of the night, the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he had come to believe in God, he and his whole family. This is the word of the Lord. according to John. And if you wish to follow it in the Church Bible, it should be found on page 1085. My prayer is not for them alone. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one, Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them and you in me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am and to see my glory, the glory you have given me because you loved me before the creation of the world. 
Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them, and will continue to make you known, in order that the love you have for me may be in them, and that I myself may be in them also. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Lord, take my words and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our lives and set them on fire with love for you, now and always. Amen. Do please be seated. Today, as our children have reminded us, uh, is the Sunday after Ascension. Ascension, of course, being one of the major festivals of the Church's year, and yet that which is probably least observed, in part because it falls on a Thursday, and who on earth goes to church on anything other than a Sunday? But it is extraordinarily important because it is the time at which suddenly the disciples are made aware that from now on, with the power of the Holy Spirit, they are called to continue Christ's work without his constant presence and encouragement in a physical form. And clearly, if you read the four Gospels in particular, you will pick up, I think, that the disciples were totally unprepared for this event. They'd heard a number of times Jesus telling them that when he was not with them. But you know what it's like. If there's a message you don't want to hear, then you simply don't register it. We've all done it. We've been told things that might happen to us, and we've gone, oh no, it won't happen to me. And I suspect some of that was reflected in the disciples' behaviour. And so, when it happened, at first, they were clearly stunned. And then the realisation dawned upon them, and as the Holy Spirit came on them, they felt empowered once more to continue the extraordinary work that had begun by their leader, Jesus. What is interesting, as an aside, is in fact that the ascension is not recorded either in Matthew or in John as such. Both make reference to the fact that Jesus would not be with them. In Matthew he says, all authority has been given in earth and heaven, go and make all, disciple, or make all people my disciples. There's the charge, as it were. And then in our Gospel reading from John today, we hear several times repeated in different forms that idea, may they all be one in you as you are in me and I in you. May the world see that we are one. And it is intriguing to see that that charge from John, the charge to be as one, is one of those subjects which somehow seems to have vaguely slipped from our agenda. We will talk, and indeed we will confess when we say the creed later, I believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. The word Catholic, of course, immediately, and I tested this the other day, makes people think of Roman Catholic church. No, it isn't. It is simply a word meaning whole. We pray that the church may be whole and not divided. And it isn't at all easy to achieve. It's very easy to talk about, but actually creating unity, as we know, even amongst a group of people, can be an extraordinary achievement. And I'm intrigued by the fact that when I was first ordained uh, last century, Think about it. <laughs> One of the subjects which preoccupied an enormous number 
of those involved in forming sort of policies was church unity. The Anglican Methodist scheme, anybody over 90 like me will remember it well, was something which had a huge amount of effort put into it, but which eventually failed, as indeed did several other schemes. And the week of prayer for Christian unity was an enormous event. Now, for some, of course, it still is, but for many, the week passes in January, probably without many of us even noticing. But it does not mean that church unity is something we should ignore. We rationalise it wonderfully as human beings. And I've heard it said so many times, diversity is fine as long as there isn't division. Well, actually, if you read that passage from John, there is little evidence to support that idea. We are intended to witness to the world as one, as the body of Christ. And I still firmly believe that if one day we could achieve that unity, it would make a bigger impression on our world than any other single thing that we do. Just look at this community. At this moment in time, there will be at least four or five groups of Christians worshipping in their own places of worship. What does that say to the society in which we live? I leave you to think about it. But today, we have two for one offer because our epistle takes us down a different line. And although every preacher is taught, and Alan will remember this more than any, stay with one theme, our readings force us into two. So it's a two for one offer. Because when you now move into the epistle, you hear of that extraordinary series of events surrounding Paul and Silas. Paul and Silas were on their way to worship <coughs> when they saw this slave. She was a really nice little earner for her owners because she was a fortune teller and they were making a bomb out of her. And she comes to Paul and Silas, she is beside them, she is following them and they realise she is deeply disturbed and eventually they think we're going to have to do something about this. And so they heal her. And you can imagine the outrage of her owners who see their income suddenly disappear. And because those Christians, those religious people, have suddenly started interfering in the world of economics, they are outraged and they go to the magistrates and they lodge a complaint. These people are claiming to be Jews, but who are also Christians. What do they think they're doing, interfering in anything other than the world of religion itself? And they are found guilty. They are publicly flogged. They are put in prison. And then an event of seismic proportions takes place. It's an earthquake, but it is also an indication, it seems to me, of the seismic effect of this event and of other events that followed as the church, as Christians, became involved more and more in affecting the affairs of the state of the world. A huge step forward. For Paul and Silas, it meant that the earthquake opened the doors of the prison. The poor old prison warder who had been told specifically to look after them is about to kill himself when suddenly he looks and realises that the prisoners are still there and eventually he is so impressed by the behaviour of Paul and Silas and those around them that he himself becomes a Christian and so do his whole household. Extraordinary. Absolutely amazing to see the impact that they had on that man and how their actions in trying to help someone who was clearly in great distress lead to all of these implications. 
Strangely enough, whilst I was thinking about this passage and this sermon, I had the great privilege, if privilege it is, to be a guest at the civic dinner at Tyrrell's Wood. And I found myself seated on a table of people whose political views were very different from my own, I have to say. But one of them, realising that as a clergyman, thought here's a bit of common ground, and so let's talk about the archbishop, you know, like you do. Um, and she came out with this wonderful statement. I think the Archbishop of Canterbury is a marvellous man if only he wouldn't interfere in the affairs of the world. Those are <laughs> her exact words. And I wonder then, are there a lot of us who share those views? Because if we do, we haven't been studying the life of Jesus at all. Everything he did from trying to sort out the plight of the lepers who couldn't contribute to the economy and therefore were completely rejected, from the Samaritans whose human rights were denied, to those who were sinners, who obviously had fallen foul of the law, who he sat and dined with and tried to help on their program of rehabilitation when society had clearly pushed them to one side. You can all add to the list of occasions when Jesus interfered in the affairs of the world. It's a huge effect. And we are challenged to do the same. It isn't easy. It isn't easy sometimes to stand up or sit up when you're with a group of people whose views are very different from your own and say what you think at the risk of upsetting them, of them choking on their wine on this occasion. <laughs> but we are called to do it. That is what we are. We are Christians intended to engage in the world, to defend the rights of other people, and wherever we see them being infringed, to stand up and proclaim what should happen even though the policies of the government of the time may seem to contradict what we know is right. That is the second part of our challenge for today. Firstly, to present ourselves as one, which will give us much more power in presenting ourselves to the world. And secondly, in being prepared to have a seismic effect on those around us, just as Paul and Silas's behaviour had a seismic effect on that slave girl and indeed on the prison warder and no doubt many others. May God give us the strength and the will to fulfil his purpose for us. Have a moment of quiet. Dear Lord, we come before you this morning in awe and wonder, knowing that each one of us here matters to you and that you hear our prayers. We thank you and praise you, Lord, for the joy that the coming celebrations of your servant Elizabeth's Jubilee are generating. We thank you for the steadfast example of courage and commitment that she has been throughout her long reign. And we ask for your blessing on her and her family and that the Christian faith that shines through her service will be apparent to all and to lead more to follow you as she does. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. But along with the celebration, Lord, there is immense sadness in your broken world. We bring before you the people of Uvalde in Texas after the cruel shooting this week. And all those dying, injured, 
fleeing from their homes in the war in Ukraine. Grant them the strength to bear their pain and grief and work in the hearts and minds of those in positions of power and influence to consider anew ways of bringing peace and an end to wanton violence. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. We are so fortunate, Father, through your goodness, to live in a just and affluent society. But even here, the huge rising costs are taking their toll on our communities. We thank you, Lord, for all those who are working to help. Food banks, support charities, pastoral teams, and particularly today, the work of Christians Against Poverty here in this area. Lord, grant those in need of help the wisdom and courage to seek the help they need and give strength to those who will provide it, especially to Jenny Coles and her team in the CAP and the work they do. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Yeah. We pray, Lord, for our community, for the residents of Douglas House and Roger Simmons Court, for our fellowship for Peter, Alan, Chris, Susan, Joy, and Carol and for Alan and Susie Jenkins as they steer the growth component of our church development plan. And we pray, Lord, for all the events that will take place in the coming days, especially those organized by Churches Together here in Bookham. And we remember David's words that we are all one body. And we pray that you will give us the opportunity to show ourselves as one body of Christ in this place. We give you thanks, Lord, for your provision that has enabled our PCC to give the go-ahead yesterday to the changes for St. Nicholas that had been approved. And we ask, Lord, that this work will be to your glory and advance your mission in this place. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. We know that you are a God of compassion, Lord, and so we bring before you all those who are sick, in mind, body, or spirit, at home, in hospital, in hospice care, and by name, Eldred, Tim, Sylvia, Cherry, Catherine, and Valerie. We pray for all who care for them, Lord, be they family, medical staff, or carers, that you may grant them strength, courage, and compassion. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Dear Lord, we pray for those who have died and all who grieve for them. And we remember particularly today Peter Marshall and Derek Parker and their families and all whose anniversaries occur at this time. We ask, Lord, that you will be, through your word and your disciples, alongside those who mourn, to comfort and encourage them and grant them hope for the future. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Amen. Father God, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray to your mercy and protection today and always. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen.